<laughs> my biggest dream was to have a ranch in my backyard. And all of a sudden, I got this bird ranch, and I got a loop, and I got a corkscrew, and it doesn't make a ranch. And I had no idea that that dream would be as big as it became. But this life just doesn't end. The beauty of it is that it hasn't ended yet. And I'm living it every day. <laughs> attention and also it's uh, it happened in my backyard so it's a little introduction about me so I've lived in T Lake Tahoe since 1984 raised two sons there and I was on two school boards in Lake Tahoe first on South in South Lake Tahoe when we lived there uh, when my first son was in kindergarten or before he was in kindergarten for two years and then we bought a house in the north shore of Lake Tahoe they had nothing on the school board and so they appointed me to that position and then I ran for four more terms. So altogether about 12 years on two different school boards in Lake Tahoe and that's when I became involved with CSBA again in the 80s and 90s, so <clears throat> pretty early. Um, so that tells you a little bit about my background in terms of education and or sitting in your seats. Um, also, I ran, I had my own marketing and advertising company. I, I moved to Lake Tahoe as the marketing director for Heavenly Ski Resort That's and then awesome. had started having babies and decided I couldn't do that full time. So I started my own marketing and advertising company and uh, we became involved with the state of California to do the dream campaign, which you've seen the Arnold Schwarzenegger commercials and the, you know, all the funny commercials. Those are the consumer version. This is the business to business version. We use these to try to uh, drive business to California. So um, there's a whole bunch of them online called the California Dream. And this was one of the first ones that we did in Lake Tahoe. Bob Burquist was a, a student um, in Tahoe Truckee for years before I was on the board. And then he became a pro skater. And, and so I helped uh, develop these commercial products that we did. I showed this particular one because I love the idea that um, I can tell you that when we brought these people together, None of them had ever worked on a project like this. I mean, we had a guy who was a boat builder, another guy who was an engineer, obviously a few professional skateboarders, and the idea of bringing them together from really different backgrounds and making them uh, all work on a project together is a lot like a school board. Really, I was asking some of the people here what they did you know, here in Cayuga so I could live here and figure out what my next <laughs> iteration of my life is going to look like. Um, and all of you come together from very different backgrounds. I mean, a lot of you have educational backgrounds or teaching backgrounds, but really you come to this table with a lot of different skill sets. And I think the challenge is to sort of figure out where your strengths and weaknesses are and how to bring them all together to accomplish a mutual goal like these guys did to accomplish a mutual goal. Huh. All, and you're all just as important as one another. I mean, no one has, is more important than anyone else when it comes to um, making this team a success or failure. So it's important to think about things that way. And also, I love what um, Bob says at the end, that all his dreams came true in California. I mean, I think that's what I tried to instill in my children growing up in the little town of Lake Tahoe. You know, it's sort of a fishbowl like that probably this is, right? Very <coughs> insulated community in that 
anything you want to do, anything you want to accomplish, the resources are just to drive away. I mean, if you want to get in Silicon Valley, if you want to be in tech, if you want to be in whatever it may be, um, the resources are here and they're close by. It's not like we live in just a farming community in the middle of Kansas, you know, where there's not a lot of opportunities for you. Um, interestingly enough, though, I think about this often. When I was on the school board, I had all these thoughts about what skills my kids needed for life. Mm -hmm. And both of them are in professions now that never even existed <laughs> when I was on the school mm -hmm. board, right? They weren't even anything we could have imagined. So one is a solar engineer who turns farms that are uh, no longer farms into solar farms. Mm -hmm. So he does the engineering plans for making farms into solar farms. My other son, I'm going to brag for a second, it was just on Chopped. Oh, oh nice. Yeah. He got chopped in the dessert round. Oh. <laughs> so he did all right. Well, he, he made it pretty far he, then. He made it pretty far. But he's been spending the last <clears throat> four years of his life as a celebrity chef on shows like that around oh, Europe. no way. And then he got on the one here in the U.S. And he uh, gets flown places and cooks for people. Oh, so, I mean, celebrity chef? My brother is a chef and worked, you know, at like Dunkin' Donuts and, oh. you know, <laughs> flipping, flipping, flipping awesome. burgers and stuff. And I was just like, celebrity chef? How did those two things become? come to go together so again and now and Brandon really makes his living by food blogging so he blogs for different companies and uh, on processes for should have brought things. him so yeah <laughs> I, mean, I would if I could ever have a moment of his time right. yeah. he's flying off to he was just in ex, where was he um Tulum a client celebrity client one of the executives from yep. Google flew him to Tulum Where's for his Tulum? birthday party near Cancun yeah, okay. yeah. So, it's really nice. It's really, yeah, I hear it's really, it's really he sent me pictures. I hear it's really nice. Yeah. Cancun's here and then it's really nice over, over here. here, over here. Yeah. That's what he said. So, you know, when you're thinking about, thank you, Hannah. I appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> when you're thinking about the things, the decisions that you make and the things that we have to think about for children in the future, you don't have a crystal ball. Just like I didn't have a crystal ball, mm -hmm. so it's hard to imagine it's good. Um, it's a good point. what our children might need and what skill sets mm -hmm. they may need moving forward. So we'll talk about that a little bit today as we go through your self-evaluation and go through some goal setting and some things that are important to you. Can I interrupt with yes, a please process do. point? It, it is a board meeting, and we need to call it to uh, order, take the role yeah, to the right. Pledge of Allegiance. You're right. Usually I just introduce myself, then I have you do that. Well, do the formalities, Terry. Here, so here let's, we are. let's do the formalities. Okay. Gee, my roll caller just left. I think um, we can roll, call our roll, roll. call. <laughs> so roll call. All the members are present except Mr. Wilson, who isn't able to be here. If you'll join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, approval of the agenda. Does anybody have any concerns about or any requested changes to the agenda? <laughs> Seeing none, we'll move on. Public Didn't comment. even pause. <laughs> <laughs> Um, public comment. There is no public to comment, so we'll move past that. And now, thank you, Terry. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. So the last thing I'll say about this is, um, so I don't just come to you from being a school board member, and I don't work in the office at CSBA. In fact, I'm in the office maybe two days a year. Mm -hmm. I'm know. always out on the road. Um, they hired me. In set, when I was living in Sacramento to kind of fill in for Leslie Demersman, who you may have known, who was out. She did one of our workshops. While. Yeah. And then um, I stayed on with them when I when we got transferred to the Central Valley because there was a lot of need in the Central Valley. There's, a, there's been a lot of um, turnover in elections there the last couple of years. And so I was pretty busy there for the last couple of years. And I work all over the state. This year has been the busiest year we've ever had with Luann and I doing probably Gosh, I think I've done 15 workshops in the last month. Wow. So I'm on the road a lot. I work with a lot of boards all over the state. So what I'm going to talk to you about a lot is um, best practices and things that we've seen work for other districts. So this isn't from some CSBA book or manual. It's really a compilation of what we've seen in the last, uh, oh, in, in the last two years. The dynamics of what's going on in school boards has really changed from the time I was on the board and even from the time I started this work in terms of how people work together and the people that are getting elected um, to positions. And so um, our tactics really have to change about how we work together. 
Okay, so that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm going to ask you guys today to follow and adhere closely to our meeting guidelines, which means everybody participates, that you actively listen, um, you're open, that all opinions matter. We agree that all opinions matter today. We're open and honest in identifying challenges, and especially since we don't have a, an audience here, I think we can have some frank discussions about things that we're finding challenging. And then we're going to identify solutions and assign responsibility for the solutions to our challenges. So I talked to um, you all on the phone before I came here. And so these are the things from both your self-evaluation and from our conversations that I think we would benefit in talking about today. And then you have the opportunity right now to add to this list. So um, I think we need to review our self-evaluation and revise our, I know you guys have a governance handbook already, but I don't want to go through that big lengthy document. I want to just see what comes up with regard to protocols we may need. And I'll provide those to Hannah after this meeting, and she can update that at a future date after we talk about that. Um, we want to discuss community confidence, why it's important, and things that affect it, because I just got the general feeling from all of you that there seems to be an erosion, perhaps, of the community confidence in the work of the board, and so we need to talk about why that's important, and what's affecting that, and what things we can do to maybe change that. <coughs> We, um, we had, there was some discussion about a protocol regarding board deliberation and board member motions and the uh, opportunity to make motions. And so I just want to clarify how that works. And then, um, most of all, and this is my thing that I put in the end, it's really difficult when you've had a board that's had stressful times, right, to put the past behind you and put behind you the things that have happened that have maybe caused some discourse. So I'm going to ask you, from, for the purposes of today's meeting and moving forward, to think about sort of hitting the reset button on what's happened between all of you in the past and think about positive solutions for moving forward and thinking about the things that you want to accomplish for the children of your district moving forward and how we could do that in a positive way and what things we could put in place um, to make you all feel like more of a team. I realize an election's coming up soon and there may be a changeover in the board. I don't know who's running and who's not or who knows what's going to happen in election year these, time, these days. But I think for these last few months of all of you being together, you should think about the things that you want to leave as a legacy for this district that if, even if new board members come in place, um, your superintendent can take that direction and continue moving in a positive direction toward the implementation of your goals, if that makes sense. Is there anything else you guys want to add to this list? And I'll chart it if there's anything else in particular that you want to add, or we can just keep moving forward. Anything? This is a pretty good list. I think it's a lot to get through today. Um, <laughs> in terms of how the day is going to go, I'm going to work through lunch. I'm going to let you guys eat. I can never eat during these things. I'm get on a roll, and I, there's no stopping me. So <laughs> we're going to have you guys eat through lunch, or work. Uh, I'll work through lunch. You'll eat through lunch, and we'll continue to work. And we'll just get you out of here as you know, time and fashion, if that's okay with you. Yeah? Okay. Okay. So um, <clears throat> these are the things we're going to talk about. I'm going to just start with a, just a few reminders about foundations of effective governance and your board roles and responsibilities. And then we're going to get into your evaluation results. I gave you all because you wanted to see your self-evaluation early. Normally, I, I unveil it. Normally, I use the element of surprise, and I unveil it at the meeting, but you all got it early via email from Hannah. Um, so I asked you to, your homework was to circle a couple of questions you want to address, and you'll have the opportunity to do that here in just a few minutes. So the first exercise I have for you is um, to get you talking, if you don't mind. So I put together some folders for you with a bunch of resources, but the first thing I'd like you to take a look at is in the right-hand right -hand pocket of your folder, the first sheet you should see is a sheet of two-sided of quotes. Now, you all have different ones, so you don't all have the same one, um, because I put together a bunch of quotes on leadership. And I'd like you to think about the kind of leader that you think maybe you are or the kind of leadership qualities that resonate with you. Take a look through these quotes, and if you wouldn't mind, just five minutes, I'm going to have you just take five minutes to look at them. As soon as one sort of resonates with you, I'd like you to circle it, and I'm going to ask you to share it. And then the second part of this exercise is I want you to think about, ask yourself this question, what in your early years of childhood influenced your decision to be a school board member? What do you think happened to you early in your life that sort of put you on this, might have put you on this path? So I'm just going to reconvene at um, 
right on the 9.30 mark. So I'll give you just oh, a the few clock's minutes. right. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, a, like 3 o'clock last week <laughs> when we had our board meeting. Yeah. So just take a look. And the first quote or two that resonate with you, circle it, and I'm going to have you share it. Got one? I'm going to share mine with you first. <clears throat> and this is sort of my theme for today about leadership. The very essence of leadership is that you have a vision. It's got to be a vision you articulate clearly and forcefully at every occasion. You can't blow an uncertain trumpet. So the challenge I'm going to have for all of you today as we move forward is think about what your vision is as a board collectively and how you articulate that. And um, I'm going to challenge you to hopefully come up with something that you feel is your mission as a board. And um, we're going to talk about ways to articulate that so that the community feels like they're compelled to follow it. And to whether you're here after November or not here after November, that it's something that will live on in terms of something that this board put in place. Why don't you start, Val? What was your what was what your, I chose? Yeah, with what you chose. 
How do you choose um, five of them? Um, I know, I got four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's okay, exactly. we're a small group, you can share them. Um, I marked one of them twice. Right? Hold on. Um, <coughs> The one I, I, I marked twice was leaders think and talk about solutions. Followers think and talk about the problem. Um, and the reason I chose that is I, to try to stay away from the negative of problems and mm -hmm. try to come up with positives. Well, problems need to be identified to have solutions, right? So sometimes sure. they do. But um, in terms of your, your communication to your community, it's really important that they know that you are aware of things that you want to change and things that need to be changed, but that you're focused on the solutions. And I mean, today is a really positive step. That's what you guys are doing in terms of you're looking at the way that your board works together and coming up with ways to work together better, right? Or identifying the things that you might have as, a, as weaknesses and trying to strengthen them. And so that's, a, I think it's a good step in the right direction. In that regard, what other what other one do you, did you want to share? Oh gosh, wow! Um, the teacher in me uh, liked uh, never tell people how to do things. Tell them what to do, and they will surprise you with their ingenuity. I saw that as teaching more than board yeah. member, but <laughs> <laughs> I recently listened to a TED talk where they talked about. They said you can't uh, give a child a book to teach them to walk, right? They have to figure that out. You can encourage them by saying, you know, little baby, come here, come here. But they have to figure that out. We don't learn how to do most of what we learn how to do from getting instructions of how to do it, right? So tell us why you think, um, what you think might have influenced your decision to be on the school board. Maybe something. Why, why those? No, why, what, what might that have happened question. to you in your early childhood or life or that maybe did, may influenced you to go into education and ultimately to want to serve on a school board? Well, my, uh, my mom was a principal secretary in uh, East Los Angeles and um, I, think, I think I was always around education even though I was probably in the background of, right. of culture, life. Um, and uh, going through the, the military particularly, um, I found value in education. I think that when you're, when you're faced with, you know, my time with war and that sort of thing, um, it, uh, it encouraged me that there was more than, than just taking a job. There was something that I could do, uh, that I'd enjoy, and it would change every day. Every day would be something different. Mm -hmm. um, and that attracted me. And I've been there a long time now. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm at the last step of that long time, <laughs> um, for a whole bunch of reasons. Part of it's age, uh, but the other part of it is, is uh, with the exception of being an administrator, um, I think I've, I've completed that circle, and now it's time to get back. <coughs> great. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. Scott, do you want to go next? Um, Your quote first. My quote, I like the Sam Walton one right at the beginning. We're, we're all different. But we all have different ones. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you don't so, all have different ones, but some of you have different ones. I mean, I like um, I have a couple different pages. So mine's from Sam Walton. Um, outstanding leaders go out of their way to boost the self-esteem of their personnel. If people believe in themselves, it's amazing what they can accomplish. That's a superintendent's job in a nutshell, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have to go any farther. Yeah. Yeah, and what what brought you here, Terry? I mean, Scott. Um, I got into education because of um, I became a substitute teacher. Just thought it would be fun. I always like working on kids. 
Um, I thought it'd be fun, something to do on the side because I was running my own business at the time. Um, and then enjoyed it so much and they offered me a full-time job. And so I took it teaching seventh grade math, pre-algebra and then became an eighth grade teacher and was really enjoying it. Um, but there was a lot of dysfunction in the district I was in. And I remember standing at my door one afternoon after I had seen some pretty um, bad things happen on the campus that day. And I just thought there's gotta be a better way to manage all this. And then my second thought was I have no right to complain if I'm not willing to try and jump in and do something about it. So that's when I decided to try and become a vice principal. And Hardest job in the world, don't you think? And, oh, oh was, my God, you're the hammer every day. You have to be the hammer every yeah, day. It was pretty difficult. Yeah. And uh, and so I did that for three years and ended up over elementary principal and middle school principal and district office positions. But um, really, I, um, I kind of ended up here. Um, it was kind of a perfect storm because I loved where I was at. I had no desire to leave where I was at. Um, there were some things though that I ended up as administrative um, assistant superintendent of administrative services. And so I was in charge of the whole fiscal side of the house. And there were some payments that were being made that I thought were inappropriate that led to me um, getting in conflict with some other parts of the administration. And uh, and so I, and then I saw this opportunity and this is where I grew up, so. Um, he went here. That's what I, you said, he's I, people being you know, home. I probably would never have left if it wasn't to come back home. Yeah. Um, and, and here I thought it was a great opportunity to give back to the community where I grew up and also um, just have a change of pace. And you know the dynamics of the community too because you lived here and you grew up here and you were raised here so it's kind of nice to put those two things together, isn't it? And it's been a lot of fun kind of getting reacquainted with some people that I knew from way back when. Um, it keeps happening. A parent that I didn't realize married um, a good friend of my brother um, I met with her yesterday and it was like, oh, okay, now I'm making the connection of who you are, but she's been, <laughs> you know, I've been seeing her come on campus for a year and a half, but I didn't realize, you know, the connection there that, um, who she was married well, to. Well, when you live in beautiful places, people don't leave. <laughs> I get it. That's terrific. Thanks for sharing. Terry, do you want to share with us? Um, sure. I, I had a lot of trouble actually with the sentences because many of them are make sense in the in the perspective of a, of a hierarchical organization, but a school board is anything other than a hierarchical right. um, uh, organization. So there there are things here uh, things that I completely agree about as far as uh, leadership goes, but I don't think they apply to a school board. So, probably the one that is most succinctly um, expresses what, what I think and I don't like some of the even I don't like some of the language here because it's military. But uh, from George Patton, a good plan violently executed now is better than a perfect plan executed next week. So uh, I, you know, I think that one of the elements of leadership is identifying either problems or hopefully setting goals and having a vision and moving to execute it and recognizing that what we're going to do is is not going to be perfect um and but get on with it don't mm -hmm. just 
One of the things I always say, Terry, is when you're on a school board, you realize that sometimes, or most of the time, the decisions that you make are not always the right decisions. And by right, I mean right for everybody. You have to make the best decisions possible to affect the most amount, you know, the greatest amount of your population. And so it's interesting, a board I recently worked with in the Bay Area has a, a kind of a rule when it comes to their LCAP and adopting an LCAP every year. They have the staff bring to them the two least effective programs. They say, we want to start with looking at the two least effective programs. And by least effective, they mean the ones that are um, not affecting the greatest amount of children. Now, it doesn't mean there are programs that are not effective for that population that they're affecting. They might be doing great things for 10 or 12 or 14 kids. But they have to look at, if they're going to bring something new on, you know, there's only a certain amount of money, there's only a certain amount of people's effort and time <coughs> and staffing. So they look at the things that are affecting the least amount of children and adopt new things that are affecting the greatest amount of children. And, and so they're the ones who said to me and really sort of taught me this, it's not, it's not a right decision because there's, there's no right decision here. The right decision would be we have enough money to do all of these things so we can afford to do this program that's only affecting 15 children. But we have to make the best decision. And so I think that's something school boards, it's really hard. It's, a, it's an internal conflict for me anyway, it was for me. And how do I, um, how do I tell these 15 kids that we're not gonna do this thing anymore that's working for you because we have to do this other thing that's gonna help hopefully or um, move the needle forward for 200 kids. That kind of goes along with that quote that I also like. I cannot give you the formula for success, but I can give you the formula for failure, which is to try to please everybody. Everybody. <laughs> mm, it's true. Yeah. And to try to, and unfortunately in education, don't you think we try to pile things on top of things on top of things on top of things? And it's hard for us to sort of let go of the things that... I, I like to use the word optimum or the phrase optimum because to me best is something that can, I can probably identify and if I were living in an unconstrained world and had all the resources I could get there but I don't live in that world I haven't mm -hmm. found that world yet so I'm looking for ways where I can do the best that is reasonable to right. do under the so Terry what made you what do you think made you get involved uh, in this crazy, <laughs> this crazy thing that you do? Well, I'm, I'm very, very far away from uh, education. I, I've never, I was divorced when my kids were young. They didn't grow up with me, so I didn't have a lot of high school um, school experience with them. Um, I grew up in a small community in a public high school. Uh, in a, in a public school environment, and I really feel very strongly about the importance of public schooling. And um, I see to some extent, well, there are lots of forces that would threaten it in California. So that was one thing that I wanted to do. I'm, I'm still not sure that it ever would have occurred to me to run for school board, let alone any other public office. I'm an engineer and a computer guy and an introvert, so some of this is a stressor for me just to get started. But um, four years ago, um, Jim Brescia, who was the superintendent here at the time, couldn't find a candidate for school board. And um, so uh, he and I ended up talking. And I said, well, I, you know, I can't bring you any educational background that would help, but I do have uh, quite a bit of business experience in management. I've done a lot of volunteer work. I really, uh, now that I'm retired, I do a lot of volunteer work, and I enjoy uh, helping people. I have board experience and experience with proper schools and other stuff like that. So I thought that I might be able to combine those things and make the contribution. Great. So far, so good. <laughs> well, it's not for me to judge. That's for others to judge. Carrie, do you want to go next? I did a, a few. Um, I'm just going to read them all first. Sure, and then go. 
So leadership is a potent combination of strategy and character. But if you must be without one, be without strategy. I think character is hugely important. Um, another one I liked is my responsibility is getting all my players playing for the name on the front of the jersey, not on the back. And I agree with Terry, some of these are more higher hierarchy. But I like this one because as a board, as you said, we're, none of us have any more power than the other ones. And I don't think that we're effectively playing together at the moment. So that's why I liked that one. Um, and the last one, well, I have two more, but a competent leader can get efficient service from poor troops, while on the contrary, an incapable leader can demoralize the best of our troops. And I chose that one. That's not pointed at you, Scott. It's as saying a leader. It's as us as a whole, because we're not functioning well, I think we're demoralizing the best of troops. And in my mind, the best of the troops is our stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll so, we're going to talk about that. I'm going to go into that in a little right. bit. But that's why I like that one. <clears throat> um, as far as what, I can't think of one certain thing as far as my childhood decision. I've always been very analytical, and so it's like rules are rules, and when they're not followed, I don't like that. Um, I was involved in student government in high school. I was, on the site, I was a student site council member. I was president of my dorm in college, so I've always kind of been in different things. Um, and the reason I ran for school board ultimately was the superintendent um, did some things at the time when my daughter was in fourth grade that I didn't appreciate. And uh, nobody could do anything about it. The school board said I should do certain things, and I did, and they wouldn't do anything. The county office wouldn't do anything. I um, had a complaint against him that went all the way to the state, and they couldn't do anything. And so then I'm like, okay, fine, I'm getting on the board. So, mm -hmm. And I'm still into, I mean, I still, there's rules for a reason, and when they're not followed, I have a problem with that. And it's important that everybody is aware. And sometimes, you know, I find often that, especially new board members come on a board and <clears throat> there's a culture. There's already a culture developed on a board <clears throat> about how people work together and how things get done. And, and um, I think one of the things that we're poorest at sometimes in, on boards is onboarding new people and mm -hmm. letting them understand the culture and letting them understand. I mean, did anybody give you the rule book when you <laughs> came on board? Like, here are the things, here's how we do things here. And sometimes a lot of it's unspoken. And that's why people might scoff at norms and protocols, but I think it's really important. And I said this to Hannah, she's like, um, we adopted this governance handbook, I don't know, three years ago or whatever, reviewed it three years ago. And I said, well, did Susan buy off on it? Because you're the newest board member, right, Susan? Yeah, two. Yeah, mm -hmm. you and Val. Did, um, did you guys go through it, one protocol and norm at a time, and decide that that worked for you too? Or were you part of that? Handbook? Yes or no question. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know I know the answer. Yeah. And so it's important that when new board members come on board, that they're onboarded in a way that's uh, collaborative. So it's like, here's our rule book. Here's how we decided to do things before you got on the board. Are you okay with this? Do you agree with this? Um, should we revise these to make it something that you're comfortable with so that you're all on the same page? So anyway, we'll talk about that once we as we go further, but when, if we develop any protocols or norms I, today, they should be ones that you all agree on. I, I'd just make one comment, although the, mm -hmm. the date of the most recent revision uh, is three years ago, probably. I've been on the board, this is my fourth year on the board, and my perception is that the document was developed a significant period of time before I came on the board, and that we have almost never referred to it. It, it is not, I don't see it mm -hmm. as something being <clears throat> central. I don't think it's a particularly well done document. Mm -hmm. and I, I haven't seen it, it, Terry, so I don't know. Well, Terry, before exists. that, when I first got on the board in 2010, mm -hmm. my very first meeting, they were approving it, and I refused to approve it because I'd gone to meetings for a year. There was never any discussion on it. So you can't vote on something that hadn't been. So, mm -hmm. and, that, and before that, it was adopted by Hannah and Melanie. Yeah. They went to some conference, so it was never, it's never been a collaborative board. Or even this one, like you said, it was just kind of here it is. Let's, yeah. Yeah. we. we uh, although I, I think there was a process here from for from this one, idea, right, of making it collaborative. But one of the results is if you look through it, this section is entirely done differently from the next section. Right. There's overlap. Yeah. Uh, so, so I don't find it a very useful document. I wish. We, had a better one, but I've never found time yeah. in my four years to 
make this a priority. Yeah, I agree. But um, the thing I'll say about that, Terry, is what I suggest to boards who have a, a comprehensive governance handbook is when we come in to facilitate, I say, you know, this is only as good as it being institutionalized, right? It can sit on a shelf and gather dust and be just like your board bylaws or board policies, you know, there's it's a stack of paper this high, if you put it in, put it on paper, and what does it mean? You need to pick out the things that are relevant to you and into, to, relevant to your day-to-day -day operations, and sometimes that's identifying things you're having issues with. Like, um, I'll give you a for instance, sometimes boards have issues with the idea of having a rule around board member requests for information, right? So I, there's probably a protocol in your governance handbook that says all board member requests for information should go through the superintendent, something like that. I don't know if that's, but that's a typical one. And sometimes it goes on to say board member requests for, individual board member requests for information that take more than 20 minutes of the superintendent's time require a vote of the board. Sometimes that's a protocol that people have. Um, sometimes it's in people's governance handbooks and it's written there, that exact protocol, and no one on the board is ever aware of it. So it's really only as good as the fact that you're all aware of it, that you've all agreed to it, and that you all call each other on it. Because there's no protocol police, you know, they don't send me in from CSBA with handcuffs to, to do, <laughs> call you away because you asked something of the superintendent that takes two hours of his time, you know, nobody does that. It's up to you guys to police each other on the rules that you all agree on. So that's why I say it's really uh, a board self-evaluation is a good, good tool to help you identify those things that aren't working, put some rules in place that you think you all agree on and that can work, and call each other on them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's what I'll say about protocols. So um, Susan, we didn't, <clears throat> oh, you, t you talked about, yeah, what made you want to be on this board, okay. Okay. Um, I just I, want to make sure you were done. Yes, yes, I didn't yes. want to cut you off. Okay, I think I had a few on here as well. Um, uh, you manage things. You lead people. I like that. Um, I liked a leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. I liked that one. But probably the one I'll land on is um, the challenge of leadership is to be strong, but not rude, be kind, but not weak, be bold, but not bully, be thoughtful, but not lazy, be humble, but not timid, be proud, but not arrogant, have humor, but without folly. I really liked that one, so I don't know what it has to do with and, and leadership, the, but it, to me it actually just... Who wrote that? Uh, that is Jim Rohn. It just kind of encapsulates, I think, who I am trying to be on the board. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to be strong and not rude and kind and not, but not weak, um, bold and not a bully, and you know, all of those things. So um, it's a good, that's a really good synthesis of being a leader in any position. Um, I told you guys my husband's active duty military, so before he became a command chief, he was in security forces. And so he's been, really? he's been struggling with, yeah, so he's been struggling with the kind of leader you are when you're a cop, if you oh, will, right. when you're security forces, um, versus the kind of leader you are when you're in charge of 2,700 young men and women, oh. right? Real different kind of leadership role. Mm -hmm. um, cops tend to be, security forces tend to be very direct because they're usually responding to crisis situations. He has to be now more visionary, more inspirational, softer. Um, it's been a, it's been a stretch for him. Transition. He's actually going to classes to learn to be, you know, that sort of inspirational leader. But I love that quote, and I gave him that quote actually when he became when he got this position because I said this isn't what you need to aspire to be. It's real different. Not that you weren't a great leader in mm -hmm. your other job, but this is a real different situation. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a great. Um, distillation of just leadership in general and, and any position that you're in. So Susan, what brought you to this work? Well, um, I have absolutely zero background in education um, and zero background in public education. Um, and um, however, I do care intensely about my, I have an 11 year old uh, son here in sixth grade 
and I care intensely about the kind of education he's getting. And um, I happen to be, you know, partici participating in a extracurricular activity here in the community. And some woman said, "You need to be on your school board." Mm -hmm. And I said. And this is how ignorant I was initially. I thought, oh, well, okay, so they'll put up a little roster and the ladies will walk by and check off if they want you or don't want you and <laughs> walk by in the morning and drop off their kids. I mean, I had no idea of the, I honestly thought it was like a PTA position, like it wasn't yeah. any. Yeah, I got that. I got that same speech. Oh, it's only one meeting a month. Oh, there, yeah. no, there's no, oh, you'll be great. No, there's nothing to do. <laughs> There's nothing to it. You just yeah, go be right. of service, be of service yeah. to the community, be of service to your child. And I also found that every time I was volunteering in the room, if a kid would cough, I'd come home with the flu. If they'd sniff, I'd have the flu. I just was yeah. getting sick around the kids. So I thought, okay, this is a way to be of service and have a little bit of distance. And not be in, most, not in the germ the soaked environment. In the germ <laughs> zone, exactly. So um, then I just, then I kind of jumped in. Then when I realized the level, I'm like, I'm on the ballot? You mean I'm on the ballot with Hillary and Donald Trump? Like, that people have to vote for me? Like, <laughs> yeah. this, this is, and, and they kept saying, you don't have to follow through, just like they were kind of helping me. Yeah. Just, just take one step at a time and see if it's for you. And then the more I um, sit here, the more I, the value and the importance. And I've just, it's been, I'm so grateful for the learning experience that I've had um, in being here. And I've just been soaking it up like a sponge, and I'm absolutely loving the complexity. It's it's so complex there, and when you talked about the layers, there are so many layers to this that it's um, it's quite daunting still to me. I sit in meetings, and I it still can get quite um, you know because you're you're listening to the public, you've got the dynamics happening here, um, so it can be quite daunting. Mm -hmm. But I. I'm still thriving and loving it, and um, I've got two more years, so I'm glad to be participating today well, with, I'm glad to, to bring forward with whatever happens with our, the complexion of our next board. Yeah. And you know, it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to sit in the position that you're all in, because you're right. There are a lot of voices in your head, from the public to parents to your own kids to your fellow board members, and you have to really be sort of the... Um, place that takes all of those voices, puts them all in the mix, and use your good judgment to make decisions mm -hmm. on behalf of kids. And you're right, Susan, it's really, really complex. Unfortunately, we tend to make it too, co I mean, like at CSBA, I say this to my office all the time when I'm there, okay, we tell board members, don't get in the weeds and keep your goals, you know, the hierarchy of your goals important and continue to articulate them, yet we ask them to approve every little complex that, you know every little thing that comes their way and I don't know about you but I never felt comfortable voting on something I didn't fully understand mm -hmm. so you do have to get into that deep the devil in the details to make sure that you understand what you're approving and understand the things that you're doing and that takes a lot of knowledge gathering mm -hmm. it's a difficult situation mm -hmm. yet you still have to keep your goals your, the hierarchy of your goals as your top of mind mm -hmm. you know message and your top of mind awareness so it's uh, you're, it's you're wearing a lot of different hats. Mm -hmm. Is anyone else cold? Do you want me to shut the door? Yeah, oh, no, I'm just. I, I can get a heater too. <laughs> oh, no, I could go to my car and get a jacket too. I just didn't know if anyone else was cold. No, well, I came prepared. I got two on. <laughs> <laughs> and I have current concurrent hot flashes. So I, <laughs> I have hot flashes too. Come on, bring one judge, on. You can't judge with me. <laughs> what the temperature should look like. Well, it's Scott, it's just the breeze. I think for me, it's more. Yeah. Yeah. The one cold. That I really, really like. It has nothing to do with me. Uh, <laughs> from Nelson Mandela. It is better to lead from behind and put others in front, especially when you celebrate mm -hmm. when nice things occur. You take the front line when there's danger. Then people will appreciate your leadership. I really like that. Yeah. It's like, like a all, copy of these different of ones. You can, people, yeah, you can, of all people, it yeah. I could send it to you, Carrie. I have a the document. It's like five pages of all different ones. So. Who does it come Pretty from? Cool. Nelson Mandela. Oh, you, you said yeah. that. Right, right. Yeah. yeah so, I like uh, that. Talking you. about leadership, have you guys heard of the Lighthouse Study? Some of you have been through some CSBA training might have heard of heard of the Lighthouse Study. No. Carrie has. So, I may have. I don't remember what the title. But. So Iowa, um, in I the University of Iowa did a study over a 20-year period of 
school boards. They're the only study that I'm aware of that's ever been done of school boards specifically. So they studied uh, several hundred school boards across the nation, not just in California, and they asked one simple question. Um, do boards in high-performing districts operate differently from boards in low-performing districts? So what they were trying to say is there are correlation between how the board operates and specific things that they do or ways of behavior that make a difference in student learning and achievement versus low-performing districts. So they correlated how a district was doing and how their, what their board's social capital was, how they were doing and how they were perceived as doing. Um, I thought it was really interesting that they found out, these are the two kind of highlight things that they found out had no correlation. So they found there was no correlation in personal relationships. If the board members liked each other, if they got along, if they had the same political views, etc., that made no difference in terms of student learning and achievement and the board being successful and the district being successful. There also was no correlation if the board had a strong desire for student success. Um, that didn't seem to make a difference in terms of moving the needle with regard to student learning and achievement. What they found out had a strong correlation with boards who understood their key roles and worked together as a team to go after a common goal. Mm -hmm. So that seemed to be the point of differentiation of what made a difference in terms of student learning and achievement in a district and a, a low performing school board or districts not moving forward in the right direction. I'm kind of confused because that kind of flies, it sounds like it contradicts the first one. The no, first, the, so the first one was desire for student success or personal relationships. No, nope, but there's a difference Boards between their key roles. That, yeah. That's, 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 okay. So here I'll show you the roles, Susan, and then okay. maybe it'll make it a little bit clearer. Okay. So the key roles that they agreed upon were uh, common in all the boards that were from high performing districts were boards who were willing to learn as a team, set expectations, build collective will not only among the board members but among their community create conditions for success and hold the system accountable. So basically, um, didn't matter if you were Republican or Democrat or what your religious views were, or whatever, if you were willing to be part of these five key roles or uh, buy into these five key roles as a board member that helps move the district toward the success and toward um, the accomplishment of their goals. So I think it's important um, to think about each of those. So learning as a team, what that means to me and some of the examples that they used is boards who agreed that one of their key uh, tenants was that all board members would come to the board meeting with the same information. Um, so there are lots of different protocols that different boards use to make that agreement happen. One of them is one I referenced earlier, board member request for information. So a good protocol to think about with regard to making sure that you're willing to learn as a team is that Let's just say Terry meets with the finance department because you have a particular interest in a, something that's on the agenda with regard to finance. And um, you get the answers to your questions, Terry. It's really important that the rest of the board be aware of what questions, not necessarily the questions that Terry had or the concern that he had, but a question that he had. And that you're all, you all come to the dais equipped with that same piece of information that Terry might have so that no one comes to the board meeting with any more or less information than all of you have together. So um, that's a protocol that boards put into place that if anybody goes to, that all questions usually go through the superintendent who may refer them out to other places, but that you agree that when you come to the dais before the board meeting, anything that's an agenda is something agenda is that you're gonna vote on, you agree that you're all gonna be provided with that same information. So um, recently there's been some legislation or uh, litigation enacted that will lead to some legislation that basically says if any board members are given additional information other than what's in the board packet prior to the board meeting, that that piece of information needs to be available to the public as well. Isn't that already? Uh, yeah, that's, it, it's recent. Yeah, so you probably heard about it in our last training. It's only about eight months old. No, I thought that was already yeah. a protocol. No, okay. it's not. It was, it's, that was recent that any piece of information, so in the past, for instance, um, Scott could, let's say you had a question of Scott, Scott could copy the rest of the board and say, um, Carrie had this question, or he wouldn't say Carrie had this question, that's inappropriate. A board member came in right. with this question, here's the answer to the question, just wanted you all to know. And he wouldn't have to have that piece of paper or that copy of that email available to the public. Now, if the public requests it, um, through the Public Information Act, the, those, the answers to that question do have to be made available. To How them. would they even know to request that? Well, well, they might not. They might not know to request that, but um, the, it came about 
actually in the Central Valley, in a Central Valley district, where there was a, some question about a contract that was, and the board was all uh, made aware of the parameters for the contract or some detail with regard to the contract. And someone in the audience, a, a board member actually made the competing contractor aware that the board had all gotten this piece of information that wasn't part of the board packet. So the person in the audience asked the question, they refused to, the district refused to provide them with the additional information that the board had. And so it was deemed to be um, against the Public Information Act. Because if all of you are aware, then the public needs to be aware of additional information as well. Now that doesn't mean you have to bring every single question that board members ask you to the board meeting, but it means that if you give any of the board members additional information about something that they're voting on, if the public asks the question, and it's not addressed at the board meeting. So very often, if I would ask a question of the superintendent when I was on the board, I would often say, thanks for the answer to my question. Please make sure to let the rest of the board know that I asked this or that somebody asked this so that they have the answer to my question. And so you know, I think it's important enough, I'm gonna ask it again in public because I think if I was confused about it, the public might be confused about it as well. So that's a way to handle it rather than have to have your superintendent aware of the, or you know, bring a bunch of paper to the, to the, to the district office. So any question about learning as a team about that particular protocol? Mm -hmm. um, set expectations, you know, that speaks to your goals. I often say that, and I think your goals are great goals. The question I would have for you is, do you have, um, are, they, are they goals that are measurable? And are they, are they goals that are time bound? because I think it's important when the board has goals to um, hierarchy of goals to make sure they're both measurable and time bound because that's setting an expectation. Yes, we all want students to learn and achieve, but what does that mean? And what programs are we putting in place and are they measurable and achievable within a time frame? Building collective will, that's taking the goals that you have and making sure that you articulate them to the community in a way that makes them not only the community, but your staff get behind them. Because change is hard for people, especially in education. If you've been teaching algebra the same way, Val, for <laughs> the longest time, and we tell you, the board tells you that we want you to teach it this way, not that way, as a teacher, aren't you a little resistant to that? Because it's been working for you for a lot of years, and it's hard to sort of change what you've been doing, and so um, it's important to... I think as a teacher, when somebody comes to tell me, you know, we've, we've changed the process of how we, we're going to learn, and usually it, that takes about every seven years, mm -hmm. uh, because after seven years, obviously it's too old and it can't work anymore. But <laughs> I, I think that one of the things that helps is that when you see how it's working, mm -hmm. rather than being told that this is going to be the way it is. Yeah. Then I'm more open to things like that. Yeah. Again, that's part of making your case, building collective will, right? Mm -hmm. At making sure that when you give direction to your superintendent and he has to give direction to the staff, that it's sort of it's based on something. It's based on either community need, something you see in the community, community outcry. You know, uh, one of the goals I see in a lot of districts these days is safe campuses. People want their campuses to be safe. They're getting that cry from their community, and so. Um, when they have to shift dollars to do things to make their campuses safer, you know, the call to action there is we're hearing from our community that this is a priority, that this is important. So yes, we may be taking dollars out of this program to do this, but it's because we're reacting. We're reacting to the times, we're reacting to what our community needs are. So again, having a, having a reason for the things that you're doing, building collective will among your staff, among your community. Creating conditions for success, I think that's a, it's really easy to say that, but it's, I think it's harder to implement. And what I mean by creating conditions for success is pointing everything in the direction of your goals. So everything has to be in alignment. You can't say we want to, let's say a goal is to um, increase graduation rate. You can't say we want to increase graduation rate and not put everything in alignment with regard to your budget, with regard to your programs, <clears throat> with regard to your teacher contracts to all point in that direction. Okay, otherwise it's just a statement you're articulating and it's not really something that you're working toward. So creating conditions for success means putting everything in alignment with the goal. And then holding the system accountable. That's why I say having goals that are measurable. If you really want to move the needle on a particular area, like you want to increase math scores, you want to increase graduation rate, you want to decrease um, 
absenteeism, you have to know where you're at to know if you're moving the needle and if you're achieving that goal. So it's important to have goals that are articulatable and, and uh, measurable. Oh, can I, I wanted to ask one other question. Sure, yeah. Um, can, can you yeah. flip back? Mm -hmm. um, so when I look at number one and number two, it seems to me, well, and even number three, it seems to me that those things in, in under the Brown Act in, in our setting actually require to learn something, to take on something new and learn it well enough to set expectation really requires stuff outside a normal board meeting. We're you're talking about workshops. You're absolutely right. Or other meetings like that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important, and I forget who it was who said, you know, you know, oh, being on the school board is one to one meeting a month, and, and that's yes. all. It no, is. that was me who if, said that was I was I was sold that bill of goods, Terry. Because <laughs> <laughs> if, if we're going to learn and expand our vision, it takes more than one meeting. Yeah, month. it takes conversations, and that's why I think those are some of the most underutilized meetings that you have. And if you have them, then board meetings go pretty smoothly, actually, because. You've had a workshop, like let's say you want to do something big, like let's use the school safety issue. Okay, we've decided that we want to increase school safety. There's been fights on the campus or whatever it is. So we get together for a couple hours and we talk about, you know, what that looks like. Usually you give the direction to the superintendent. Superintendent, we really want to increase school safety. Can you talk to the staff and come back to us with some plans and alternative plans so we can discuss them? Then you guys get together. You discuss the recommendations from your professionals because they're in the classroom and out on the campuses every day. And you take a look at what that looks like. You take a look at where you have your budget advisor here, where that money's going to come from, and if you have the dollars to do what you want to do. Um, and you talk about, you know, what what's important to you, what elements of it you think, think are important to you, and then how are we going to measure that? How are we going to decide if our schools are safer a year from now once we put these things into place? Um, does that mean less fights? Does that mean less bullying? What does that What does that look like? And then, so you've decided at this workshop, if you will, sort of what's going to happen, what the measurable of it is, and then it goes on the agenda. And then when it comes time for your board meeting and it's agendized, the discussion's pretty much already taken place. Or you may say during board deliberation, I've been thinking about this since the last workshop, and um, Perhaps we should add this to it, or perhaps I'm not comfortable with this, or I don't think this is strong enough. You have your deliberation, and then you go, call for the question and you vote. But but the, you're right, Terry, that the, the groundwork has already been laid because you've opened it up to conversations. And that's hard to do during a few hour board meeting, right, for big things. So on a procedural note then, like how, and you all maybe know how to make that happen, but being new, how do you make that happen around something where you're not violating the Brown Act? You're not violating the Brown Act to have a conversation meeting or a discussion meeting or a workshop, just like what we're doing today. It's a special meeting. It's a, it's special, a special meeting. meeting. Oh, okay. It's called a special meeting. It's still an open meeting. It's not, so they could it's come not and a closed listen session. Everybody could come and listen. In fact, I encourage when you have a special meeting about something that you encourage your community to come because they need to be part of the conversation too, right? It's just requesting a special meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so procedurally, would that happen at a meeting? Would so that here's what it happens. Um, once you guys decide what your goals are, and that's usually done outside of a board meeting too, that's usually done in a bit of a See, workshop. we never do that. Never. You we never, never have conversation that. meetings? It's never. a good idea to never. schedule them through the year. I just know the fear of Brown Act was put into me very mm -hmm. early on. But that's so not a violation of the Brown Act. Don't. No, you it's know, not a violation of the Brown Act. One of the things that I learned that when we went up to San Francisco, they, they had two classes on the Brown Act that were really, really good. I was really impressed. And one of the things, um, the very first thing the presenter said about the Brown Act was, you know, when you, when you have gone against the Brown Act, you're not going to be arrested. No. Nope. You're not going to go to jail. No. Nope. You're going to be aware that you did it because the Brown Act is there to make you aware. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as things happen, now you know how to adjust. Yeah. Um, no Brown Act police. It's not there to, to penalize you. It's there to guide you. That's what it's all about. And, and sometimes people take the Brown Act way up here. Way up as, there. As, you know, as the law of the land. 
as opposed to looking at it as a help because people people were abusing what the Brown Act was set to set to accomplish. Yeah, I just feel like that. But just having that, like what you're talking about, has never happened since but, I've been on the but, board. Okay, but let's go back um, when we talked about the mid-year evaluation that we just did with Scott. We lamented the absence of goals. And, and we're saying there's superintendent goals and there are board goals. We haven't talked as much about board goals. But I think we have reached consensus and have talked about the need to set goals moving forward. No, I wasn't talking about that, but that's a good She's point. just talking that's about meetings and special workshops. Thing, mm -hmm. Oh, a good example yeah. of that, of okay. having yeah. a workshop. Yeah, because okay. But okay. the superintendent goals have to be consistent with the board goals. Right, yeah. They can't be going in different directions. So that's what I say. Maybe I haven't explicitly talked about board goals as well as superintendent goals, but certainly when I've been thinking of I, I apologize if I haven't done that. So I think my oh, okay. I think my impression of what, what she's asking is we haven't really had conversation meetings. I'm not talking about a certain topic. Right. You mean we have we haven't had? We just have never done that, and that seems to me like a huge missing piece in terms. Well, of Well, we did for high school options, but I mean that was different. Mm, That's still know. a special. But so, yeah. so there are two right. kinds of special meetings, you guys. There are conversation meetings, which are usually precipitated by the board wanting to get together to deep dive into some subjects, whether it's superintendent goals, sometimes it's so safety, whatever. Super, safety, right. superintendent mid-year evaluation, or whatever that may be, or hiring some, you know, whatever. Right. So. And then there's workshops that are usually precipitated by staff saying, we want the board to be aware of a change that we're, we're going to make to accomplish one of your goals, and we want to make sure you're all on board with what we're doing. Or, starting so, from so the administration. Starting from the administration yeah. or staff will bring forward a workshop. Got it. So there's two different types of conversation meetings. The, the difference between those kinds of meetings and a board meeting is that you usually do not take action at those meetings. They're just for conversation. They do have to be open to the public. They don't have to be noticed 72 hours in advance. They can only be noticed 24 hours in advance if you want. Most people notice them 72 hours in advance just to be Open and transparent. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they're a really good opportunity when you're making big moves in a district to announce them as soon as possible, get the word out there again, so that you do have some community participation, mm -hmm. so that you um, can hear the voices of the community in your deliver and they could be part of your deliberation. But yeah, I think they're tremendously important meetings, and they make your board meeting shorter because you've already sort of come to, cons at least philosophically, come to some consensus at a workshop before you vote on it. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I wish, though, when you, when you send out an invitation to constituents, do you really get a good view of it, or do you get, the, do you get people that are overly concerned? I, that's a very good question. Probably both. And I think yeah. that's one of the biggest challenges with the LCAP, right? They, it, it requires that we get community participation. Yet, what do we do? We're not PR professionals, none of us, m most of us anyway, in districts. We call a meeting and the same six parents come to the school, right? The right. same six parents that always come. Yeah. So I've been working with lots of districts, especially districts with a very little budget, who have been doing very innovative things to actually solicit community participation like a recently a district I worked with in the Central Valley put up a tent on the soccer field on Saturday mornings when the kids were playing soccer and gave away bottles of water that they got from Costco in exchange for parents coming and telling them what they wanted for their schools. <laughs> and that's how they got that's community cool. participation. That's smart. Another district that I worked with, um, the major employer in that small town was Walmart. Walmart did a barbecue. And, and for the whole community, and they donated all the meat, and the Walmart employees did the cooking and everything in the parking lot, and said, it's tell us what you want for your school's day at Walmart in the parking lot. Oh, wow. And, you know, Sunday morning or Saturday morning, and so the community came by, and they got a little free meal from Walmart if they filled out a questionnaire about what they wanted for their schools. So instead of, again, calling the meeting and the same six parents come to schools, a lot of small districts that I've worked with have been going out of their way to go out in the community, partner with community partners, and try to solicit input from parents. Um, one district did a really cool thing. They did a Twitter party for their students where they had teachers and principals and whatever and on Twitter, and the students can ask them anything they wanted and tell them anything they wanted with no repercussions about what they wanted for their school and for their and district. And they got, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> right? And they got... Do you they, mind if I get some coffee while you... No, go me? ahead. And so they got, um, you know, student input for their, for their LCAP goals. So it's hard to... Again, we're not PR professionals. Yeah, I don't know where they yeah. got, got the input to think about these things. I love that. But it's important to, you know, reach out to the community, not just call a meeting. And by the way, this is informal, you guys. Anytime you need to get up or whatever, go do whatever. So, um, did you have another question about this slide, too? Can I move on? So, um, why do we think about governance? Anybody have an idea of why we think about governance? Governance is an awkward word. I find it to be an is. awkward word, isn't it? <laughs> I agree. It must be a word of some educator. It must be some educator. <laughs> you know what, though? It's so interesting listening to NPR, and I listen to NPR. I drive all over the state every week, so I listen to NPR religiously. Um, there's a lot of talk about governance these days yeah. because it's being so poorly done. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't say that. <laughs> but, it's okay. But, but you know, it, everything that we know about how we govern and how people govern has sort of been thrown out the window lately in a lot of ways. So it's interesting that there's conversations. Mm, that's where, an interesting. It's interesting how we're having conversations about governance and the roles of leaders. So, um, but we think about governance because, and especially from a school board perspective, from a, a practical perspective. It's not only about, in the Brown Act, the ethics that you're doing the right thing, but the public's confidence that indeed the right thing is being done. And that's what the Brown Act is all about. So I'm gonna distill the Brown Act down into one sentence for you. Do everything in public. Don't do it behind closed doors. That's the spirit of the Brown Act. The spirit of the Brown Act is that everything you do, every opinion that you express, every action that you take is taken with the ability for the public to know what that action is, where you as individual board members stand on that particular area. And so if you don't violate that, if you don't violate that spirit, I think you're okay. So board members ask me all the time, like, we're at CSBA and we all want to go to dinner together. We're at the annual conference. Can we all go to dinner together? Is that a violation of the Brown Act? Well, no, as long as you don't make decisions about what's happening in your schools and you decide on stuff at dinner and then you go back and vote on it. You know, as long as you're not doing that behind closed doors, right. if you're talking about your kids and your health and your travels and philosophically what you'd love to happen in your district and things that you dream about and what your passions are, you're okay. You're not but making you decisions behind closed doors. But you still can't discuss something that you're going to vote on, correct? You shouldn't discuss something you're going to vote on. You, honestly, if you're, if you're together socially at a dinner at the CSBA conference, you really shouldn't be talking about anything other than the things you're proud of, the successes that you have. You could, it would be perfectly appropriate for you to say, I wish that I, we had a million dollars for every kid <laughs> in our school to be able to give them everything we want, or I wish we had could have state-of-the-art computer equipment in our schools. So that would be something, if I could have one wish, that would, that's yeah. not inappropriate. You're not, you're not um, making decisions about that. You're expressing a passion or a goal or a, you know, something like that. And as long as you're not trying to convince Terry to shift her whole budget to computers or you know, making a case for it, it's okay to just talk as people about the things that are important to you. Uh, that, was, that was the one thing in that conference that I went to. Um, not to fear it. Don't fear it. You know, just be aware of it and be, be aware that you're, you're not bringing something from an individual meeting to a, a public meeting. Yeah. You're not making it, like you just said, not making a decision. You're talking about things that can help the school. Yeah. Uh, things that, that are difficult. Uh, to decide upon, but you're not you're not making a decision, and you're not you're not trying to coerce a decision. Mm -hmm. Val, I can honestly tell you, in all the um, grand jury investigations that I've been aware of in all my years with CSBA and in education, no one ever violated the Brown Act unintentionally. Yeah. When they when they were when it got to the point where they were being where it was being litigated, or when it was being brought to the grand jury they knew they were violating the Brown Act when they did the thing that they did. So no one's ever gotten in trouble for violating it unintentionally. They've gotten in trouble when they violated it blatantly and intentionally. So 
you're right, don't fear. Just really quick on, that was one of the things just first entering into all of this that really confused me that I started to try to educate the public on, which is why I'm really glad to just hear about these whole conversation meetings mm -hmm. and workshop because I said, we're, and I also learned very early on that um, the um, community versus board, like the relations and building community trust with our board. And I'm thinking, we're having to come together on an issue that none of us have talked about, and yet we're supposed to try to be like a united board and speak with one voice. This is what I learned at CSBA. And right. I'm thinking, how, how that is impossible. We just got together, we're just looking at it now, and now we're supposed to do this all in front of the public? Like, how does that work out? I said, it almost felt like it was designed to make you fail. And so, anyway, so navigating just that um, and so this now just I'm like oh well this just makes so much more sense you have conversation meetings so then when we do come together with the public we could have more of a united voice mm -hmm. with or it could give you more time to think about it or you can dive a little deeper into it than you can at a couple hour board meeting right just because less division less, less division less mm -hmm. misunderstanding less yeah. you know things that didn't need to happen you know all of that and for all of you to be able to ask the staff and your superintendent questions all hear the answers at the same time and be able to sort of digest that and question it as a group, not necessarily as individuals. Yeah. But it, it seems to me that the key of conversation meetings is for people to be better informed. It's not mm -hmm. necessarily for people to come, come to agreement. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. I, hear, I, I know that. It, I don't know what I said that implied something different. It, but. It's still, and it has to be a meeting to which everyone's invited. Exactly. Um, and you don't normally, um, I, I will say, Terry, you don't yeah. normally come to agreement necessarily in a conversation meeting. It's an opportunity, you're right, to get right. more informed, yeah. to maybe ha have you, Susan, very often after a conversation meeting, I would say, you know what, I still feel like I need to get the opinion of the community. I'm going to ask around about how people feel about this. now. But now, at least if they have questions about it, I can answer them. Or sometimes if I go out in the community to ask around, more questions come up. And so I need to call the superintendent and ask additional questions about something that's going on. But then when I come to the board meeting, all the bases are covered. Yeah. We've talked about it. I've gotten more information from my community or input from my community. I've gotten my questions answered. And now we can, during right board deliberation, we can talk about the final mm -hmm. aspects of this. Right. Everything that each one of us has gone out and individually found out deliberate and then vote and you may not all it doesn't mean you're going to have a 5-1 vote but it means you're all coming able to vote with complete information right. in in your terms and in your mind if that makes sense mm -hmm. so yeah i think they're very underutilized meetings and well, i'm not saying have, do, have a million meetings no i agree you know you think you have complete information mm -hmm. and then suddenly either coming from the public or coming from a board member new information comes comes about that you didn't either know about or has been completely separated from that. How do you? Can you bring that up? Yeah, that's again? tough. So this is just me, this is me personally speaking, and each of you have to make this decision on your own. But personally, I refused when I sat on the board to ever vote on anything that I hadn't had time to really think about. And so, if things came up at the board meeting um, that put things in a new light for me. Like sometimes people in the audience would bring something up that I had no idea was a background piece that of how this whole thing came about. And sometimes superintendents have the best intentions in the world, but they don't want to um, burden us with maybe something that might be bubbling up from staff against a recommendation or, you know, troubles. They try to kind of keep everything copacetic, right? So if, if the board asked you to do something and staff was against it or not happy with it or giving you trouble about it, you probably, Scott, would just sort of not necessarily put that on the radar or you know make a big deal out of that because you could feel like you can handle it. But sometimes if the staff is here and they're talking about it and you know you hear about it at a board meeting, it might change the way you're thinking about something. So for me, if I didn't feel comfortable voting on something or if I needed more time or energy, I would table it. I would ask for it to be tabled and maybe I'd get votes for it to be tabled until the next board meeting, or maybe I wouldn't. Maybe that my other board members felt comfortable, and that then I'd have to abstain from the vote and see how it moved forward. So 
those are the two ways that you handle it if you're not comfortable voting on something. You either try to get it tabled till you are comfortable and have all the information, or you abstain and let the vote take place if your fellow board members won't support you tabling an item. But, but the, the other thing, too, goes along with what we were talking about. If, if you have, if you are informed on an issue and then some new information comes up, you're often much better prepared to deal with it yeah. than you are if you don't feel informed and, and something comes up. Correct. So that there's always an argument for um, keep uh, getting involved. <clears throat> as much information as possible to them. Right. Yeah, you're right. So good. But I, I often have board members say to me, I hear I was at the board meeting and I was asked to vote on this thing and I didn't feel like I felt comfortable with it and I didn't have enough information or I heard something from, you know, somebody called me because they saw it on the agenda and, and I couldn't answer the questions. Then I'd say, then don't vote on it. There's no, there's no rule that says because it's on the agenda, you have, it's your meeting. It's your meeting as a board. You know, it's, it's not a, and that's a, a different point of differentiation here. It's not a public meeting. It's a business meeting of the board held in public. Oh, I like that. You know, it's like not a board <laughs> meeting. It's a business meeting of the board held in public. You control it. You decide what you vote on. You decide what you don't feel comfortable voting on. Right. It's really up to Our you. meeting that we're having in front of the public. Yeah, it's your it's board meeting. It's not for them. It's not for, it's a, it's a meeting held in public. It's a, yeah, it's not yeah. a public meeting. That's now, they, now, now the, the public, me, for. the public, <laughs> yeah. the public oh, may gosh. beg to differ with you sometimes <laughs> on that account. Wow, thank you for yeah. listening. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. But, and again, they are here to inform your deliberation. They're one voice. One and voice. One voice. And I often say this to board members. You have to think about this. So you brought it up earlier. Is it sometimes people who come to the meetings who are disgruntled about right. something, right? For every one voice that's here that's disgruntled about something, there may be 40 others who aren't here. That are not That are, are not disgruntled or are disgruntled yes, about it. You don't I know. That, I completely that's agree. My biggest concern as mm -hmm. a board member. Yeah. You know, who am I really representing here? Yeah. All of everybody. Representing everybody. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So you have to remember that that one voice is just that. It's one voice. Now, it may be representing 20 voices out there. It may be representing not, none. It may just be one voice. So that's, that. Thank that's you. the hard part for you guys to decide as to how you take all that information, use it for your board deliberation, and come to a joint decision. See, that's, let's say we're get, we get to a point where we're going to be voting on something. And here comes a, a group of people that are concerned about that particular vote. They know it's coming because we, we put out an agenda yep. for it. And so I'm hearing new things now. Right. Something that, that either I hadn't thought of or something that, that I didn't even know. And now it's coming from, from the public. Is that time to decide to table it? Is that, is that time to, to say I'm going to abstain because I don't you know? I don't feel I have all the information. Yeah. Even though that's at that particular point, we're ready to vote. So again, you have to weigh out all the consequences. So it may be something where your superintendent says, look, if you don't vote on this now, we're going to lose out in $500,000 of grant money or, you yes. know, whatever. It's a time, <laughs> time, it's a time <laughs> sensitive <laughs> issue, right? Yeah. So, so, he told us about yeah. that. So you, so you have to weigh out the consequences. That's so, a lot of money. so there are some, or if you don't vote on this now, like adopting the budget, we're in violation of the law because our budget, we have to have an adopted budget by a particular date. So again, right. you have to sort of weigh out the consequences to, to the actions. But if it's something like a new program or something that you're trying to implement or something that's happening at a school, and you're not, again, I can't tell you what to do. I'm not a lawyer and I'm not your conscience. My conscience said to me, and I think it's a best practice, if you don't feel completely informed or if new information that's coming in during the board meeting contradicts the decision that you thought you should make or you were going to make, then ask your fellow board members, say, I personally don't feel comfortable voting on this. How do you guys feel? I'd like to make a motion to table this until the next meeting until we can get more information. I like and, what you said. And they're, they're either going to be behind you or they're not. Yeah. And if, if, if they're not, and I don't feel comfortable, I would abstain from the vote. Would you abstain or vote no? I would abstain from the vote. Well, but, but let's say two things about abstaining and voting no. In both cases, there is an expectation 
Yes. The expectation is that you will vote. That's your responsibility yes. as a board member. You're right. And if you are going to abstain, and even if you're going to vote no, I think there's an expectation that you state why. Yes. So the well, Terry, I'm going to dis respectfully oh, no. disagree with this a little <laughs> oh, bit. No. So the time to explain, um, I don't like explaining no votes. I don't like when people explain their no votes after they voted. The okay. time to explain why you're going to either abstain or vote no is during board deliberation, before the vote has taken place. So I think it's important to say, let's just say, for instance, exactly what you said, things came up from the audience, um, I, would, I didn't feel comfortable voting on this issue anymore. I would say during deliberation, hey guys, because this new information has come to light, I don't feel comfortable voting on this. I would respectfully ask that I have a second to table this until the next board meeting. If it's the world goes silent and I have no second, mm -hmm. then it moves forward. Yeah. And then I could continue to say, okay, well, I guess I don't have a second, but just so you know, out of my conscience, I can't vote on this issue. I don't feel well enough, informed well enough, so I'm not gonna vote one way or the other because I don't feel like I have enough information to make a decision one way or the other. So I'll let the vote take place, but I'll be abstaining. So that's the time to explain, Terry. Yeah, I completely yeah. agree with so you. So when the vote comes, you but either vote yay or nay, Once period. the vote comes, you either vote yes or no, or you abstain. There's no discussion. You abstain from the vote. Once the vote's done and taken, it's your obligation as a member of this team to not be an obstruction to the vote. So I might not have felt comfortable voting on it, but if three of you did, and you voted yes, and it's moving forward, I heard, you heard what I had to say during deliberation. Now I'm silent. I either get behind it or, and this happened all the time when I was a, especially when I was board president. I wasn't always the most popular board president. I know that's hard to believe, but I, wasn't, I didn't always vote with the rest of my board. We had different ideas about things sometimes. But, Our reporter would be standing at the door and say to me as I'm leaving the room, Deb, how did you feel about that? I heard you impassioned, impassioned saying you were against what was going on during deliberation, and the board overruled you and voted yes. How do you feel about that? And I would always say, this was my canned response, you heard what I had to say during board deliberation. Now, out of respect for my fellow board members, I would either say, I stand behind the vote, that it's in the best interest of the children, or I would say, you heard what I had to say during deliberation. I have nothing else to say. Thank you very that much. That was in your the article that you yeah, wrote too. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. So if yeah. I if I couldn't for whatever reason stand behind the vote of the board, I at least wasn't an obstruction to the action that the board had taken. It, That's beautiful. Well while we're on the subject, isn't I think there's one more responsibility of the board member. If something is on the agenda and and you aren't comfortable, you don't feel like you have enough information to make an informed vote, then it's really the board member's responsibility to go seek more information before the board meeting, yeah. not let it carry forward to the board meeting. I agree. And say, oh, I don't have enough information. It's what you're describing is circumstances where something new comes yeah, up that's what I during the board thinking. meeting, Ooh, right. and, and that changes your perspective. Mm -hmm. So Terry, that's but, exactly to my point. So let's say I'm on your board and I um, feel like I need a lot more information and I go sit down with Scott and we go through things and he gives me a lot more information. It's really important that that information that he and I discuss get disseminated to all of you because Susan might have the same question but doesn't have time to go sit down with Scott. Or, That's what I was just going to bring or, up. You, know, you might not have the time to go sit down with Scott. And yeah. so at least you're provided with the answers to your questions so that when you come to the dais, you all are privy to the same information. Right, but if, if our agendas are published on a Friday afternoon for a Wednesday meeting with my new job, I am not spending the time during the day. I, I can't. I'm in my classroom. Yeah. And I don't know that all five of us, if Ron was here, should be burdening Scott with the same question over and over. So sometimes if there's something, I expect to get information at the board meeting because, I mean, I, there's, I don't know how you feel, Susan, or you guys feel, but there's sometimes, that's, to me, what the meeting is for is going to be explain a certain thing. Like if Scott's bringing something up in a superintendent report, I kind of expect him to explain that at the meeting. I'm not going to go through every little last Nat's ass on the agenda because that's why we have our meetings. Yeah. But so, it's a good idea, though, to um, know, you know, like, here's what I would do. Because I was a working mom when I was a, on the school board. I had two little kids. In fact, I was pregnant with the second one when I was on the 
for the first time. Um, and I had a full-time job and I had a company to run, you know, so I had a lot of stuff going on. I would call Vince, who was my superintendent prior to the meeting and say, Vince, I'm going to be honest with you. I had 10 minutes to read the board packet this week. I just have not been able to dive deep into it. Give me the highlights. Give me the highlights. What do I need to be concerned about? What do I need to be worried about? And Vince would say, well, these are the big things that we're talking about. If you have do nothing else, read the recommendation for this, because this is going to be important that the board. Now, Vince couldn't sway me. The superintendent, it wasn't his job to sway me in one direction or another. Right. But sometimes I would just call him. Just That was my prep some weeks. Some weeks I could read the whole packet. It wasn't a big deal. And call him with my questions. But some weeks I, could, I honestly couldn't. And I would call and say, what do I need to be aware of? <clears throat> or I would call the board president and say, Terry, what do I need to be aware of this week that's you know coming up? Uh, what background you can talk to one other board member and you could talk to your superintendent so I mean if you don't have time to get into the nitty-gritty at least have an idea of what you're gonna be what you should put your attention on well, if you can only have an hour to read you know one part of it but I think part of the responsibility of being a board member I disagree with that I mean you should spend more than 10 minutes in the board packet you I should I, you, I, you should but reality right. is reality Right. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. I still would expect my fellow board members to spend time to read the packet. I agree. But if there's not, if there's some information, I just don't know that if everything I have a question on, I'm going to be able to ask him ahead or Scott or anyone or Terry or whatever ahead of time. But it's best if you can. I try it's to. Really right. Best if you well, can. Right. But at least if you've looked at the materials and you right. have some questions I, that's certainly legitimate yeah the the concern is when you walk into a board meeting and say oh, i don't have any idea and i've done that yes. I mean, i'm not picking on anyone else but um that's not being prepared yeah correct well the reason i say ask the questions before the board meeting is two things we don't like surprises right the right. staff certainly doesn't like surprises and it's best if you give them the opportunity to at least come prepared to the meeting with the material that might address your question. Because if you have the question, Terry, other people do. Other people might do, and <laughs> people in the audience you. might too, and at least they come prepared right. with the material or with the answers to those questions. I think the hardest thing for staff is when questions come out of the blue from board members that they weren't even aware of, right. or when, you know, like, okay, I watch a lot of board meetings on my computer, right? Because if I'm going into a district, I like to know what I'm getting into. And so, especially in districts that are having big issues, I watch their board meetings. And I watch over and over again, board members come to the meeting with big gotchas. Like, so I heard that blah, 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 blah. What do you know about that, superintendent? That's not That's fair. Not. Why didn't you call them before you came to the meeting and say, well, I heard blah, 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 so they could at least Right. you know tell you that that's untrue information or tell you that that's really not how it went down or give you the background instead it seems like they're coming to the meeting prepared to humiliate the the superintendent and that's not productive and so you know it's hard to again it's the world that we live in you guys and it's it's interesting to me that um that's a lot how a lot of people think leadership what leadership looks like and it's sad, but that's what we're showing, we, we're seeing, you know, in the mm -hmm. world. And so I always say, you know, we teach our kids, we don't want them to bully. So let's lead by example. Let's, yeah, let's not bully one another. <laughs> let's, we're human, Pete, we're human. This is a human experience. Let's talk to each other um, like fellow human beings and with respect and get our questions answered. And, you know, that's what we should be modeling for our children. That's just me. I could give you guys if you ever if you're ever real bored with like what's on Netflix. I could give you some districts that you watch on TV that are like telenovelas. You just just when I think I've seen it all. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. Um, so again, I talked about this being elected school board members. You provide citizen oversight to protect the public interest. That's your job. Citizen oversight in what we do. Here are the realities, though. You campaign as an individual but serve as a member of a team. You don't have the authority to fix things that you might have campaigned to fix. And I like to say this especially to new board members. You know, I just did a training a couple weeks ago with LA Unified. Two of their board members were funded to the tune of $17 million to mm -hmm. be elected to the board. Oh, $17 million for a school dollars board? For a school board. Wow. Uh, by, one of them was funded primarily by the Charter Schools Association. 
She got sort of caught up in things. She's a young, brilliant young lady. And now she, they, she feels like they feel like she's beholden to them. Right. And she doesn't agree with all their tenants. So it's pretty interesting. Well, then why'd she take their money? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think she got kind of caught up in it. I really do. I don't think she knew what, you know, what right. she was getting into with getting in bed with the <laughs> Jarvis Schools Association. Anyway, but she can't fix what they want her to fix because she's one board member. And the other don't feel that the same way. How big is their board? Uh, they have a seven-member board. So your success as a board member is inextricably tried, tied to your success as a board. And I say this very often to lots of school boards, there are no successful board members on unsuccessful boards. You live and die as a team. You're either going to be judged as a successful board as a team or, uh, or not. Successful trustees are always mindful, focused, have a good manner, are prepared. And I said this before, governing will be an, new experience. So um, this is, I think, the most important board bylaw to remember, 9200, the wonderful board member authority. But as an individual, you have no authority. As an individual, you only have authority as a group of five. And you know, this is a, a distillation of what your what your job is to ensure that the values, beliefs, and priorities of the community are transformed into documents or transformed into uh, goals that are the driving force and focus that align all your district efforts. So, community confidence. I talked about how important that is. What impacts community confidence? Your meeting decorum. So, how you talk to one another. Um, a district I worked with last week, I got in big trouble for doing this, I'll never do it again, but it was really good. <laughs> <laughs> I did, uh, so I was telling you I watched their board meetings on um, YouTube, they post them all on YouTube. So I did a little, I, my son taught me how to do um, like a clip from YouTube and download it from my computer. So I did oh, what I, need I to called learn how to do that. the highlights reel of this district's last year of board meetings, and I opened the training session by showing them themselves. And they were pissed. <laughs> they Why? Were, they called my office because it was horrible. The way that they talked to each other and the way that they behaved. Well, it's not your was fault. Absolutely deplorable. You're right. It wasn't my fault. Unfortunately, the media was there. The media picked up on my little highlights reel, and the next thing you know, That's it's awful. on the news. That's awful. It's supposed to. That's awful. I mean, it was bad. It's like I threw them under the bus, and I really didn't mean to do that. I just want, I know, I almost got fired. But I just wanted to make them aware, because honestly, I don't think they were aware. I don't really think they were aware of the, and the eye rolling, and the dramatics, and the calling each other names, and you know, at one point, one board member said to the other board member, oh, of course you're going to vote like him. I know you're sleeping with him. I mean, they said this Whoa. in a public meeting <laughs> that's, uh, that's broadcast. How, you don't talk, what, do, we, do we talk to each other that way? <laughs> I mean, my gosh. So it was so I'm bad. I thought the that. only way that I could express to them how bad it was was to let them see it themselves because I don't okay. think they'd ever watch their board meetings. So, but I'm never going to do it again because it was real bad. <laughs> but it I worked, like that technique. you know what? But it kind of worked. It kind, I have to say, as much trouble as I got in, it was kind of worth it because it kind of worked. They yeah. they got it, you know. They they saw themselves and they were ashamed, and I think that was the first step in changing the behavior. I really do. So, um, you know, they weren't behaving in an ethical way, and so that affects your community confidence. The decisions that you make obviously affect your community confidence and cohesive communication. I think is the biggest thing that erodes community confidence. If Susan, if I ride up the elevator with Susan and say, Susan, what's the main thing the board's working on this year? And you say, it's school safety. And I ride down the elevator with you, Carrie, and I say, what's the main thing the board's working on this year? And you say, it's math scores. There's no cohesiveness. I don't know who to believe. And I think, well, God, that board doesn't even know what's important to them or what they're working on this year. So how can I be confident in the work that they're doing? Um, outside of your control, obviously there's scandals in districts all over the state. You know, there's like 44 active pieces of litigation going on against school boards in the state at any given wow. time. So it's crazy, and, and you have no control over what other people are doing, but the, unfortunately the public will paint us all with the same brush, <clears throat> and it just reinforces the national dialogue that we have that schools are broken, public schools are broken, and we should go to a voucher system, and you know, <laughs> all the conversations that are going on out there. And you're the only cheerleaders we have for public education, really. is our board members who really know what's going on and our teachers. 
who can uh, who can lobby our legislature for full funding for public education, which is needed. Um, so those things are outside of your control, and unfortunately, things you have to combat against. So we have to be super good to combat against those things that are out there in the media that are super bad. Mm -hmm. So um, community confidence, it, it costs. It costs in, in you know, how the community feels about you. It costs in when you have a lot of conflict on a board and the kind of effort that you have to put in to get things done. Mm -hmm. Academic optimism, if you're not feeling confident about the work that you're doing or the teachers don't see you working well together, then they don't think that they have to listen to you because mm -hmm. maybe they don't know what you're doing, so we can't decide what you're doing, and so why should we listen? Right. Um, it costs you money. And I can give you lots of examples around the state of how much money, you know, I'll, I'll give you one that you've probably heard about where I'm from in Fresno, or where I'm living right now in Fresno. One school board member took out $200,000 worth of commercials on the radio telling the community that his other school board members, his fellow school board members could not be trusted and they shouldn't pass a bond. Now they really, really needed to pass this bond because a couple of their high schools were in a very big state of disrepair. Yeah. The bond failed. And it cost that district a ton of money because the bond failed and because they had a subsequent teacher strike after the bond failed because teachers didn't want to work in those schools anymore. So then the teachers went on strike. And so this one school board member who put a bunch of his money into a radio commercial and spoke out against. Now he's being litigated against because um, he spoke out at a board meeting against a uh, curriculum that's mandated by the state <laughs> to teach uh, or to make children aware of LGBT issues. And he spoke out against that and now he's being sued by the ACLU because the board didn't censure him in his comments. He now had, the board is defending him. So he's that, on the board? He's still on the board. So that's going to be costing the board or their district several million dollars to defend him in court. So <clears throat> where, who's, who's being hurt by all so this? So you said if, so they, they failed to censure that particular board member. So yeah. if that board member was censured, would that have protected the district yes. from the suit? Yeah, if the board, if the board member, when he started to make those, the comments that he made, it was actually they talked about censuring him and they didn't have the votes to censure him. If they had censured him, so what censoring means from a legal perspective, and I'm not a lawyer, so this is in broad terms. From a legal perspective, what censoring means is when you censure an uh, individual board member, the board itself, the, the agency in the district, the board, um, put themselves apart or uh, separate. The distance, separate their liability for that individual board member action. So in the case of the person in Fresno, they could have said he censured what he said, we don't endorse, we don't believe in, and we're distancing ourselves from so these actions. So you censure for a certain topic. You can't just say, I censure Deb indefinitely. I mean, um, you, if I'm doing something illegal, so another district I work with that just censured two board members, they were doing something illegal. They were uh, violating the rights of their employees. And so by directing them, I think I gave you the example on the mm -hmm. phone, I told you she, one board member pulled up in front of the high school, threw the principal her keys and said, I'm a board member, park my car. So he fired. <laughs> Would have left the I'm car right you, there. Just when you think you've seen it all, take my job. You won't believe it. But <laughs> I mean, seriously, the sun is done. I see. So uh, see, in East LA, you throw them the key. They will take. It. They will take. The car, <laughs> right. We'll park it far away. No, LA Unified is, is an escort of bulletproof vehicles to their board meetings. Do you know that they don't drive their own cars? Times have changed. They send wow. cars for them, and they're an escorted. Yeah. That's police scary. escorts to their board meetings because there's always protests every meeting. They protest. Wow. So, so uh, help me clarify something. Mm -hmm. um, where you have someone who's speaking out against something that is state law or mm -hmm. something. Uh, when you, when I think of censure, I think of something that actually has to happen at the next board meeting because it needs to be agendized. Is that correct, a motion to censor? Um, I don't know meeting? what the procedure might be in the case of this, uh, the board member, in not the Fresno district, but the other district I worked with that they censured her, they actually held a special board meeting. Well, but yeah. that's still the next board yeah, meeting. Yeah, they held a special they board meeting immediately after her action and after the principal was threatening to file a lawsuit against her for harassment in the workplace or whatever. They immediately held a board meeting. They, uh, What's immediately, like the next like day? Or? Like that, 
afternoon, like after that happened, like hours. Well, and so they called an emergency. They called an emergency meeting. Yeah, working. they brought in legal counsel and, and they voted to censure her because they knew a lawsuit was impending and they wanted to, well, they did it for two reasons. They did it to make a statement that we as the rest of the board do not condone or allow this type of behavior and we don't want someone who acts this way to be associated with our board. So they did it from a philosophical reason, but they also did it from the legal perspective of if this district's going to be sued, we want her to be sued, not us, because that was right. her well, action. But I, I think I understand what Terry's asking. So let's say a board member does something, who cares what the example is, in a particular board mm -hmm. meeting, can... Can the can, presiding so like, officer... Yeah, so right then and there... Like, someone and say, you can't say that. Here. No. Okay. No, you can't. It takes a, it takes the action. Exactly. But could the but like let's say Terry did something. Could one of us as a board member say I make a motion to censure Terry because of X Y Z? No, no it has to be agendized. It's not on the right. You have to call a special meeting. It has to be agendized. I strongly suggest if you're going to do it, um, the legal team is consulted beforehand to make sure you have grounds. Because usually the grounds are they're doing something illegal or immoral, or they're doing something that's you know obviously but, something. But even wrong. then, just so. Every, Carrie and I have talked about this in the past. Um, the fact that somebody's censured does not remove them from the board. Does not remove the them from board the board. Meeting, nope. They're a member of the board. No, nope. it just protects the district. It's just yeah. in that instance, the board has separated itself yeah. from the action. Does not remove them from the board. You can't stop them from talking. You can't talk them from stop them from voting. Mm -hmm. You can't stop them from doing anything. But what it what it does is it distances the board and the liability of the board from the liability of that individual person. But if there's not a liability, if you just don't, if the rest of the majority of the board well, thinks if it's illegal, like um, for instance, one district, uh, again, the board member refused to allow, well, tried to refuse to allow something to be agendized that was a legal requirement and said because of religion, well, there were three actually board members who said uh, out of religious grounds, even though it was a legal requirement, they did not want to adopt it. Um, they could have been, Said it was a seven-member board. Those people mm -hmm. have been censured because they were, they were opening the board up to liability. But then again, is it censured? Just how long does that censure last? I mean, is it just it's for that particular vote? So I'm, again, I'm not a lawyer, right, okay. so they will tell you. But no, it's, it lasts until an investigation takes place. Sometimes those things are brought to the grand jury after after that for illegal. Sometimes they're they're prosecuted, actually, literally prosecuted. Yeah, I, I, I can't imagine a board voting to. I guess it could happen. Remove a censure. I, I think they. they yeah, last. The They're board can't vote to remove a censure. Once they've censured, mm -hmm. and once that's happened, it goes to an independent committee, usually the county office of ed or uh, grand jury or some who has to investigate and make a recommendation. That I wonder it, what's happening with that Paso guy that got censured. Which guy? There's a Paso board member got censured last year. For what? Um, I, just being an ass, I think. I don't remember all the details, but he was. At every meeting, he was belligerent, and he, I don't remember, but he got censured. Last year, right, or the year before? The only other um, reason I've seen people be censured other than legal, for legal purposes, like the board didn't want to be liable for their actions, is if, um, and this has happened a couple times in the years that I've been here, someone is crazy. Like, there was a board member who really seriously was had Alzheimer's or had some brain issues, and would like swear and yell and be violent at board meetings, and so they had to censure him until he could be recalled, until they could get a recall in place because it was really disruptive. But even so, the censuring it until the recall happened. Yeah, he was still allowed at the board still meetings. There. Yeah, but they would. But make still sends a message. We don't agree yeah. with what you're well, doing. Well, the president would make an announcement at the beginning of the board meeting. Board member so and so is censured. Uh, we've chosen to recuse ourselves from any of it, their actions, so whatever they say is of their own opinions, not the opinion of the board or not you know, the opinion of the board. So. so, ultimately, when you lose money and when you have those kinds of disagreements, it impacts student achievement, uh, obviously, when, when your budget is impacted by dollars in that kind of way. So, um, Communication, both verbal and nonverbal. I think it's important to be aware of this. Yeah, I know you guys aren't videotaped, but if you do have IRS members here, that body language is about 55% of what you convey. Like I was saying in, the, in those videos, people didn't always say bad things, but their actions sort of, yeah, you know, like that. Yeah. Very good. Uh, <laughs> their actions sort of convey only 7% of what people perceive when you're, when you're speaking is your words. 
You know, that doesn't mean your words aren't important, especially in this day and age where you can be quoted at any moment on Twitter or, you know, people could be videotaping you from the audience and you don't know. Your words are certainly important. But it's important to be aware of your body language. Um, and it's a cyclical sort of effect. Community confidence reduces teacher optimism. If your community is not happy and teachers are hearing about it, they're the first line you are going to hear about it when people are dropping off their kids. Um, if you don't have teachers who are enthusiastic about their work, work, it's certainly going to affect your student engagement. And if your students are engaged, um, then community confidence is going to be affected because your student achievement is going to go down, right? Because you don't have engaged students. So it's a very cyclical effect. So, you know, this just bears out the research that the Lighthouse study does, did. It says how you work together as a team and the things that you do affects student learning and achievement and obviously affects community optimism for what you do. And remember, <laughs> someone is always watching. And it's in the case of my little experiment with the videotape clips, and I was being recorded without my knowledge from the audience, and someone was recording what was up on the screen, and you just never know who's watching when, wherever you might be, and what they're saying. Um, so this just reiterates what we talked about before. It's your job to set the direction, establish the structure, provide the support for your goals, ensure accountability, and act as community leaders throughout. Uh, is disagreement on a board okay? Yes. So I love this quote by Herbert Hoover. It's a vital process among free men, right? To have opinions, and that's why we're all elected for your different opinions. Um, and I already touched on this. When should you express disagreement? When is the proper deliberation? Time to avoid deliberation. And what should we do if we disagree with something the board votes for? I illustrated sort of my personal belief. In you heard what I had to done. say. You heard what I had to say during deliberation. But I stand behind my board. I stand behind my board or I have nothing to say, nothing more to say. What do you think causes the most disagreement between board members? Can you guess? The most disagreement? I'll tell you. Money's the most obvious, no. obvious thing. But. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to illustrate it for you. So what the board's supposed to do <clears throat> is develop these things. So you're the, you're the yellow circle here. Beliefs, vision, mission, policies, priorities, right? That's what your job is to develop those things. And then the staff, this blue circle here, you tell them what you want to do and what you believe in and where you want the district to go. And then they develop with their professional expertise, action plans, implementation plans, ways to evaluate if they're going in the direction you want them to go, progress reports. So this is all the job of the administration, teachers and staff. This is the job of the governance team, which is the board and the superintendent. The superintendent sort of resolves in this, uh, resides in this green area here, where they take the beliefs, vision, mission, and policies of the board, develop some strategic goals and success indicators for those goals, and then make the staff accountable to make them happen. So here's where disagreement happens, the most disagreement on the board. The board is supposed to determine the what, what we want to happen. The staff is supposed to determine the how, the staff and superintendent. I find most disagreement happens, and if you read any board, I, I will challenge you to read any board minutes, the disagreement happens when the people who are supposed to determine the what, that's you guys, get into the how. Get into the how. So when you start talking about the how, that's when disagreement happens, right? So the example, we want to make schools safe. That's the what. Superintendent, we want to make schools safe. We want our schools to be safer. Come back to us with the how. You come back to him with the how, and Terry says, no, I don't think that's good enough. I think we need bulletproof glass. And Val says, yeah, I don't think bulletproof glass is good enough either. I think we need to arm teachers, right? Hmm. They've gone into the how. They're out of the what now. They, they told you the what. You're supposed to determine the how. But because they're board members and they were X whatever, they've decided that they're going to tell you how to do what they've asked you to do. But, but let's take that example. Um, because having a plan to, you can either have a plan to improve school safety or you can have a plan to make the school safe. Okay, I, I contend the second is unobtainable, it's, right. so you shouldn't. But board members, I think, can have legitimate input and I, and I guess this is why you need the success indicators. If you say, we're going to improve school safety, 
then you have the board would have a responsibility to say what is the indicator of having Correct. improved our school safety or right. how much improvement did we need. Boy, and those are really, really hard things to to enumerate. Yeah, they are. But, it's the, but right, it's the indicator or the goal, but how he figures that out is up to but Scott I, and yeah, staff. Yeah, but I'm saying, I, in cases like that, I don't, I don't know how to write that goal. I'm not nearly smart enough or experienced yeah. enough. Well, the, the way you write that, that goal, goal is we want our schools, we want to improve school safety, right? That's yeah. important to us. Yeah. We feel like too many strangers are getting on campus, or for whatever reason you come up with, you're going to have some reasons why you would come up with that goal, Terry. And then you give it to staff who are there on a day-to-day -day basis to say, I think if we did A, B, and C, that would in improve school safety, and we would have, and the indicators might be, less strangers wandering the campus, less kids getting into fights or, uh, you know, whatever whatever your indicators may be. Less, uh, um, what do you call it when you, the word is evading me right now. Uh, expulsions, less expulsions. Oh, expulsions, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe that's a school safety indicator, right? That we I think have we have expulsions any. <laughs> on, on our campuses. Whatever they may be, then it's your job to assess if those things are working and if they're not. And if they're not, going back to the staff and saying, okay, these things aren't, don't seem to be working, what more Try do again. you need from us? <laughs> do over. Yeah, what more do you need from us to make sure that our goal is implemented or that we're making progress in the right direction if it's even possible? So you, again, you don't get out of it once you determine the what, you assess it. You know, you're, you're the people who measure if it's working or it's not working and hold the system accountable for it. That makes any sense but we assess the what i'll give you a, an example yes. that i love to use it's my most hated thing that's happened this whole year <laughs> so i was working with a district in silicon valley a bunch of very very smart people who decided that they wanted uh, two years ago when i worked with them they wanted to implement a new uh, math and science curriculum math and science curriculum and set of standards so um different than common core a different a little an enhancement to common core let's mm -hmm. put it that way so they gave the superintendent this job to do this, and he said, okay, here's the team I want to pick to do this task or implement this task. And the, and the board said, oh, no, no, no. We don't, that team's not good enough. You know what, we're Silicon Valley. We have the best and brightest. We all work with the best and brightest in math and science. We're gonna, we want to put some people on that team. So not only did they tell the superintendent, your team isn't good enough, we're gonna pick the team. So they, you know, he's the football coach, but they're telling him whose players are today mm -hmm. and what play they're gonna play, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So then the team that they picked, their hand-picked team, spent a year studying what they wanted to do and came back with a recommendation. And by then, two board members had changed on the board. And so this team who's been working for a year, best and brightest that this board picked, came back with a recommendation, the board voted against it. <laughs> So what does that say to your community? What does that say to these people who volunteered to be on this team to assess everything? It says, the board thinks they know better than we do, and they picked us and told us to do this job, and now they're telling us our year's worth of work was worthless. And the superintendent said, well, you know what? I could have told you that they would vote against that because it's too extreme. You know, The board's never going to go for that, and it's too expensive, the recommendations that they're <clears throat> making. Had they left my team in place, we might have come up with a different situation. But basically, this board's telling us we don't trust anybody. We don't trust our superintendent. We don't trust our community who's making these recommendations. They think they're omnipotent and know it all. The superintendent resigned. So, I mean, they blew it. They blew it with their community. They blew it with their staff. Because, you know, the first thing they did when they wouldn't let staff determine the how is they told staff, we don't trust you. We don't trust your expertise. There's smarter people out there who work in business that are going to determine the how, mm. right? So that's a really good example of a board getting too much into the how, um, the disagreements that that caused among the board members, because they didn't all agree that that's how it should be done. The trust they eroded with the superintendent and the staff, and the trust they eroded in the community, because they got into the how. And I see it over and over and over again. Sometimes it's in little ways, sometimes it's in really big ways like that. But again, it's your job to determine the what and measure if the how, because really, if you tell the superintendent how to do their job and the staff how to do their job, what, who their players are, just like board members getting involved in HR decisions, if you pick his players, can you really hold them accountable for their how they're doing if you didn't let him pick his own team? 
mean, he's your one employee. He's who you assess. So you have to let uh, let them pick their team and let them determine how they're going to accomplish your goals. So when, <coughs> when you get to that that point of teachers and staff creating their action plan, they have a buy-in into it. They've already, mm -hmm. you know, this is, this is something they can get behind because they created it. Yeah. Uh, it's not something that was shoved out. Right. Where they may already have a negative feeling about it. Yeah. You but know from a teacher standpoint, we right? We don't do it that way. We never have. Yeah. <laughs> and this too shall pass. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Would you say every seven years? Can I use the restroom? Okay. Yeah, I know. I need to use. Um, I need. I do too. Let's take a break. Why don't we take a um, about a five minute break? Scott was going to say. Yes, just, go ahead, Scott. Just before we go to break, um, you know, picking data to measure goals can also be kind of tricky. Um, you know, for instance, um, you know, obviously one of the leading indicators that. The state has embraced and most school districts have embraced is lowering suspension rates and yet when I took over Vista Verde Middle School which was a school completely out of control at the time and the state um, administrator that was assigned to the district sent me there to clean it up um, the first year there we had a big spike in suspensions because mm -hmm. you were fixing the problem getting yeah. things under control yeah um, you know and, and so Sometimes, depending on the type of goal you're after, you you kind of also need a time frame in mind on when do we expect to see measurable yeah. results. And back then, under the old CST system, we didn't get our testing data back until you know August and yeah. sep early September would be the release. I think end of August, early September would be the public release of the testing results. And so, you know, we go from you know, May and, and, and uh, or even April and, you know, parents complaining to the district about suspensions and, you know, the, the people wondering why are there so many suspensions happening over there and it's almost six months until we get test, yeah. test results yeah. back to show that, that what we're doing is helping student achievement yeah. um, because we're holding kids accountable. Um, there can be a kind of a gap there, so it can be kind of tricky depending on what the goal is and right. what the measurement is. And well, that's why I think it's really data. important. I'm sorry I didn't say this. So the measurement, the measurement of those goals should be determined by both of you, should be determined by all of you together. It's not the board saying, "Here's how we're going to measure it." It's the board saying to you, "How do Scott? How do we? How are we going to measure this?" You not only coming up with the how, but coming up with the ways that you think are measurable that make sense. So. You know, the one goal that I see a lot of boards do is uh, we want to increase graduation rate. Well, we want to do it in a year. Well, the superintendent will say, I can't do, do that in a year. It's not a fair measurement in a year. It's a fair measurement maybe in two years or in three years. And, and I can maybe get where you want to get in seven years. But the truth of the matter is, here's how long it's going to take for me to get there. And here's how long it's going to be before you see measurement. So the goals that you determine the measurability is a get, is a conversation you guys have and you decide on things that make sense for all of you with that kind of stuff exactly what you were talking about keeping in, in, in mind the variables okay let's take a break and uh, come back in about 20 after